I'd like to acknowledge our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, and pay my respects to all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters from whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, and to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here this evening, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. I'd like to welcome everybody here to the second Jim Kerr address. This is something that we have thought about deep and long in Nicomos as to whether this is something we could sustain every year, whether it's something we might do every couple of years. But we think it's very much something that is great to commemorate today, the 18th of April, which is the International Day for Monuments and Sites. When Sheridan contacted me last year and said, would we be ready to, would we be willing to have this um, here last year and again this year, I thought, we must. It's absolutely appropriate that we have it here. We have this miracle of a place that we're looking after now, that we're preparing, that we are renewing so mindfully, and, and this idea that we are continuing the legacy and, and the respect for James Semple Kerr means that we must have it here and we will in the future have it here as well. We had a trust meeting today and we spent some time today talking about our vision and mission and values. Our vision is to be as bold and inspiring as the Opera House itself. Our mission is twofold, to care for and renew the Opera House for future generations of artists, audience and visitors and to inspire and strengthen the community. And as I was thinking of that, I was thinking how completely relevant it is to what we're discussing tonight. The challenge between acknowledging what there was, what it is that we, what it is that has made this opera house the miracle that it is, and doing what Utzon himself said, which is to prepare the opera house for what goes ahead because it must evolve and change as, as needs changed. This building, properly managed, like the great cathedrals of Europe, would be there in two, three, four hundred years' time or longer. Over that time, there would be several occasions when its interior would have to be renewed because of the various utilities that would have become obsolete and probably because of further changes of use. Very early on in my chairmanship, where it was my great good fortune to join the Trust as we approached the 25th anniversary of its opening in 1998, it became clear that we should have a set of design principles that would inform any architect working on the building in the future as to how to design at that time within the framework of the principles that were formed by the original architect of the building and he was still alive. Clearly the re-engagement with Jorn Utzon as original architect was something that simply had to be done as a moral right of our generation. But it had to be done in a way that was constructive for him as an architect and for the building as it was now used. Now, while architects are known for their professional longevity, nevertheless, as Utzon was approaching his 80s, there was an unstated question as to his mental state for the task. At the airport on the day of flying out, I saw the front page of The Australian, a huge photograph of whales in Sydney Harbour, and one of them with its tail up in the air and the opera house behind. So of course I bought it, and soon after meeting Utzon, plonked it down and said, isn't that amazing? His immediate response was, I know what sort of whales they are. Really? Yes, they're New South Wales. <laughs> boom, boom, no doubt about the mental state. Clearly his mind is as sharp as ever and that proved to be the case as, as our discussions progressed. I have to say that in this discourse he was most generous in his understanding of the difficulties that his successor architects wrestled with in terms of these spaces. I also want to acknowledge the work of Richard Johnson, a major architect in his own right, who set aside his own well-developed architectural vocabulary to immerse himself in the Utzon vision and language and to humbly serve the project assisting Utzon. With the design principles completed, and incidentally for a fee which just about was the same as the last unpaid bill he had from the New South Wales Government in 1965, we were able to progress to the Conservation Management Plan, which Jim Semple Kerr did as the third edition of that plan. With those two documents in place, a renewed effort was then made to secure the heritage listing of the Opera House nationally and internationally. 
When it was inscribed on the UNESCO list, it was the first building of that century to enter the list, and as I understand it, set the first precedent of a listing which involved a protocol for the progressive alteration of its interiors according to the design principles and the conservation management plan, rather than fixing it as built. It's gratifying to think that out of the tragedy and drama of the dismissal of Utsun, the process of his re-engagement established a precedent for the management of iconic buildings and having the original architect set down guiding principles for any future work on that building and to have those principles enshrined in its management plan. One of the central issues that has become clear, at least to me, is that one can articulate the design principles and the vision for the building, but nevertheless they will still be high-level statements. Their interpretation will depend on the genius or otherwise of a particular architect working on the building at a distant time. Regrettably, you can't legislate for quality in this regard. Therefore, management and the trustees have to be absolutely painstakingly dedicated to utilising the best expert advice in selecting any architect to work on the building. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to add my comments to this series of talks and commemorating the works and the great works and the great legacy of Dr. Jim Simple Kerr. Thank you. We remain grateful to our partners, the Sydney Opera House and the Heritage Council of New South Wales for making possible again uh, the celebration of Jim Kerr's legacy on the International Day on Monuments and Sites. Finally, once again, join me in thanking our partners, corporate sponsors, and especially our speaker tonight, Joe Skazinski. I wish you all a safe journey home and look forward to seeing you at our next Jim Kerr address, which will be delivered by Richard Johnson. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>